Ever watch dust motes dancing in a sunbeam? That mesmerizing jiggle that's brownie in motion. Yeah. And you know what? It's not just random. Right. Today, we're taking Feynman's lectures on physics as our guide to uncover how this tiny dance reveals huge truths about the universe, even dipping our toes into the quantum realm. You know, it's funny. When you think about brownie in motion, it's like this little window into a world we can't even see, the world of molecules. It's like each jiggle is whispering secrets about the universe. Exactly. And Feynman, he uses the example of pollen grains in water, right? Yeah, pollen grains are a classic example. But then he goes on to talk about ancient water, like water trapped in quartz for millions of years. Millions of years, and still those tiny particles are moving. It's incredible. So even in this ancient water trapped for millennia, those particles are still doing their thing. It's not about life or something pushing them around. No, it's something much more fundamental. It's the inherent motion of matter itself. We're talking about the kinetic theory, which says that even seemingly still objects are made up of particles in constant motion. Okay, so even those seemingly heavy particles are bouncing around, how does that even work? Well, think of it this way. Each particle, no matter how big or small, has an average kinetic energy. Right. Okay, so there's some inherent energy there. And that energy is represented by this equation, KT. Yeah. And that KT part, that's crucial. It represents the energy associated with temperature. So the hotter it is, the more energy those particles have and the more they jiggle. You got it. And here's the thing. Even though those particles are constantly bumping into each other. Like a chaotic dance floor. Exactly. We don't see them moving in straight lines, right? Yeah. Instead, they're getting jostled around in random directions. It's like a giant invisible game of bumper cars is happening at the microscopic level. You know, Feynman uses this fantastic analogy to explain this. Imagine watching a giant push ball. Oh, like those huge balls you see at school events. Exactly. A giant push ball. But you're watching it from really, really far away. Okay, I'm picturing it. Now... You can't see all the people pushing, right? right? All you see is this ball erratically bouncing around. Ah, I see where you're going with this. That's brownie in motion, in action. It's the result of all those unseen collisions. So we've got all this seemingly random motion. How do physicists take that and go, aha, now we understand something profound about the universe? It all starts with a surprisingly simple but incredibly powerful concept, thermal equilibrium. Okay, thermal equilibrium, doesn't that just mean things tend to reach the same temperature over time? That's the basic idea, but Feynman really drives home how much we can actually figure out just by assuming that things at the same temperature, they want to stay that way. Okay, I guess that seems kind of obvious, right? Like, hot things cool down, cold things warm up. It seems obvious, but it's more than just hot and cold. It's about how energy is distributed. When systems are in thermal equilibrium, they're constantly exchanging energy until they hit that perfect balance. I see. So it's not just about the temperature itself. It's about the energy being spread out in a very specific way. You got it. And to truly understand how this applies to Brownian motion, Feynman uses this really clever thought experiment. He imagines a particle, but it's got this little prong sticking out. A prong. Yeah, a prong. And it's getting bombarded by all these tiny pellets. Okay, what are the pellets representing? They're representing an ideal gas. Ah, so we're simplifying things to get at the core concept. Exactly. It's much easier to visualize and understand the particle's behavior when it's interacting with this simplified system. Right, makes sense. So this particle with the prong is getting hit by these pellets from all sides, and that's like our Brownian motion. Exactly. And what this helps us understand is that Brownian motion isn't just some random chaotic dance, you know. It's a dance that eventually leads to a very specific kind of balance. Okay, so we've got these jiggling particles. We've got this concept of thermal equilibrium. How does this translate to, you know, something we can actually see or use in the real world? Well, let's take a seemingly unrelated example. Imagine a super sensitive mirror in a lab, like the kind used in a ballistic galvanometer. A ballistic galvanometer. Those are those incredibly precise instruments, right? You got it. They're used to measure tiny, tiny forces. We're talking about super sensitive stuff here. So we're talking about some seriously high-tech mirrors. Precisely. But even these meticulously engineered mirrors, they have a problem. They jiggle. Jiggle? You mean they actually move? They move, and guess what the culprit is? Wait a minute, you're not going to tell me it's brownie in motion, are you? You guessed it. It's brownie in motion rearing its head again. I never would have thought of that. So how does that even work? 
How can those tiny random collisions actually affect something so precise? Remember, the mirror exists at a certain temperature. Right, room temperature, I assume. Sure, and what does that mean? It means it has an average kinetic energy. Because of all those air molecules constantly bombarding it. Bingo. And that energy, it translates into tiny vibrations in the mirror. That's wild. I mean, how much are we talking about here? Can you even quantify how much these mirrors actually move? There's a formula for that, of course. Mm -hmm. It relates the average jiggle of the mirror to its temperature, its moment of inertia, which is basically a measure of how resistant it is to rotating, and its natural frequency, how fast it wants to wobble back and forth naturally. Okay, don't leave me hanging. What's the formula? And the formula is AV is FG KDAU2. This tells us that the average squared angular displacement of the mirror, basically how much it wobbles on average, is directly proportional to KAT. KT, there it is again. That temperature and energy relationship just keeps popping up. It's everywhere. And that realization, it has huge implications. It means that even at these incredibly small scales, temperature matters. In fact, scientists and engineers use this knowledge to improve sensitive instruments. Really? How so? If they need less jiggle, they can cool the mirror down or try to isolate it from temperature fluctuations. Wow, that's amazing. So we've gone from dust motes to these high precision mirrors, and it all comes back to this invisible world of jiggling particles and temperature. But it doesn't stop there, does it? You're right, it doesn't stop there. Believe it or not, this concept of Brownian motion, it even affects the electronics we rely on every day. Okay, so you're saying that Brownian motion is somehow affecting our electronics. I have to admit, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that one. Think about it this way. Imagine you have this super sensitive amplifier, like the kind audiophiles use for high-end sound, or the kind scientists use to pick up those faint signals from space. So we're talking about situations where even the tiniest bit of noise would be a bad thing, right? Exactly. And that, my friend, is where Brownie Motion decides to make a rather unwelcome appearance in the form of something called Johnson noise. Johnson noise. Okay, I've never heard of that. What is that exactly? Remember how we've been talking about those electrons constantly moving, always jiggling around because of thermal Perfect. energy? Like our microscopic bumper cars. Perfect analogy. Yeah. Now picture those bumper cars, those electrons, inside any electrical conductor especially mm -hmm. resistors, they're constantly <laughs> bumping around, right? Right, still with me. Well, as they're doing their little dance, they create these tiny fluctuating electric fields. And those electric fields, they produce those small variations in voltage that we experience as, mm. you guessed it, noise. So are you telling me that some of that noise we hear in our headphones, that faint hissing sound, even when there's no music playing, that's actually those tiny electrons doing their Brownian dance? You hit the nail on the head. And here's the kicker. This isn't just some minor annoyance. It was a huge discovery in electronics. It meant that there was a fundamental limit to how quiet you can make an electronic circuit. Doesn't matter how perfectly you build it, you can't escape that noise. Wow. So the universe is basically saying you can't escape thermal energy, not even in your fancy circuits. It's amazing how this theme of thermal equilibrium and Brownian motion just keeps popping up in all these unexpected places. So where does it lead us next? You're never going to believe this, but our journey into the world of jiggling particles, it actually leads us to one of the biggest mysteries in physics back in the early 1900s. Okay, you've got my attention. What's this mystery? It's called black body radiation. Black body radiation? Okay, I'm not going to lie. That sounds kind of intimidating. It's really not as complicated as it sounds. Imagine this. You have a closed box, but the walls of this box are perfectly reflective, like a mirror on the inside. Now, inside this box, put a charged oscillator. Okay, I think I'm following so far. So it's like a perfectly sealed box, and inside we have something that can vibrate, like maybe an electron in an atom. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. So this electron, it's hanging on the box, and as it vibrates, it's radiating energy, right? Yeah. But this energy, it's in the form of electromagnetic waves light. Okay, so we've got light bouncing around inside this box. Now, this is where things get interesting. According to classical physics, which was the prevailing theory back then, this electron should keep radiating energy until it's lost all of it and just comes to a standstill. But the box is closed, right? Where's the energy going to go? That's the thing. It can't escape. And that's where classical physics kind of ran into a wall. The electron is emitting this radiation, but it's trapped inside the box. So it bounces back and forth, and eventually the electron isn't just emitting radiation, it's also absorbing it from those reflections. So it's like a constant give and take, this dance between emitting and absorbing energy. You got it. 
It's like a never ending game of energy ping pong. And just like with those jiggling particles we talked about earlier, this dance leads to, you guessed it, a state of thermal equilibrium. The electron maintains a constant average energy, absorbing just as much as it emits. Okay, I'm with you so far, but where does the catastrophe part come in? Well, here is where classical physics starts to show some cracks. You see, according to the classical theory, the energy distribution of this black body radiation, that basically how much energy was radiated at different frequencies, it should just keep increasing as the frequency goes up forever. Hold on. Are you saying if I open this box, I'm going to be met with like an infinite amount of energy? Not quite infinite, but according to classical physics, even everyday objects like your oven, should be emitting a ton of high-energy radiation just sitting there at room temperature. Wait, so my oven should be shooting out x-rays right now? You'd think so, but we all know that's not happening, right? I think I would have noticed that by now. So clearly something wasn't quite right with the classical theory. What was the solution to this ultraviolet catastrophe? That's where Max Planck comes in with a revolutionary idea that completely changed the game of physics. Okay, I'm on the edge of my seat. Does Planck's solution have something to do with those jiggling particles? You bet it does. Planck was trying to solve this very problem with black body radiation, and he realized he could only explain what was really happening if he made a pretty radical assumption. Okay, I love a good radical assumption. What are we talking about here? Planck proposed that energy, it, it can't just be emitted or absorbed continuously like classical physics always assumed. Instead, he said, it happens in these tiny, discrete packets. And we call those packets quanta. So instead of this smooth, continuous flow of energy, it's more like like a staircase. You can only go up or down in these set increments, no in-between. That's a fantastic way to think about it. Each step on that staircase, that's a quantum of energy. <clears throat> and the size of each step, well, that depends on the frequency of the radiation, higher frequency, bigger step, more energy. Uh, okay, I think I see where you're going with this. So at really high frequencies, like those ultraviolet waves and x-rays, those energy steps are going to be massive, right? Yeah. Exactly. And remember, there's only so much energy to go around. So it's much less likely for that electron to have enough energy to just jump up those huge steps and emit those high energy quanta. Ah, so that's why the black body radiation curve doesn't just keep climbing forever at high frequencies. It hits a limit because those high energy jumps are just too difficult for the electron to make most of the time. Precisely. It all comes down to those quantized energy levels. Mm. And it was a huge breakthrough, really. It meant that our understanding of energy itself needed a complete overhaul. So Planck's solution to this problem of light in a box, it revolutionized physics. But how does this radical idea tie back to our original topic, Brownian motion? It feels like we've gone on quite the tangent. It might seem like a bit of a detour, but we needed to venture into that quantum realm to understand the full picture of Brownian motion. You see, right around the same time that Planck was shaking things up with his quanta, Einstein and Smolikowski were developing a mathematical description of how those tiny particles move. And this is where it all comes together, right? Exactly. Einstein and Smolikowski, they used this really neat concept called the random walk to model Brownian motion. Imagine each step of this walk being a collision with a water molecule. Okay, I'm picturing it. So the particle is just getting bombarded, taking these random steps based on those collisions. That's the idea. These collisions are happening incredibly fast and in completely random directions, sending the particle on this chaotic path. It's like that drunkard's walk analogy, but with way more collisions happening. Precisely. And the amazing thing is, even though each individual collision is random, we can still describe the particle's overall movement statistically. So even though we can't predict where the particle will go next, we can say something about its average behavior over time. You got it. One of the key things they figured out was that the average square distance a particle travels in a random walk, well, that's directly proportional to time. Okay, that makes sense intuitively. The longer you watch, the farther it's likely to have strayed from where it started. But what factors play into how far it actually wanders? Well, temperature plays a role, of course. Right. Hotter temperatures mean more energy, more frantic movement. Yeah, exactly. The size of the particle matters, too. I would imagine a bigger, heavier particle would be tougher to push around than a tiny one. Exactly. It's less affected by those collisions. And there's one more factor, the viscosity of the fluid itself. Ah, so like the difference between moving through water versus, say, honey. Perfect example. Mm. Honey's much more viscous. So a particle would travel much farther in a less viscous fluid, like water, compared to something like honey. So we have this elegant equation that describes the random walk of particles connecting distance, time, 
temperature, particle size, even the viscosity of the fluid. That's incredible. Oh. But you said this was a huge E deal for physics. Why? Because by carefully studying the random walks of these particles, physicists could actually determine two fundamental constants, Boltzmann's constant and Avogadro's number. Okay, quick refresher, those are. Boltzmann's constant, that's the one that links the average kinetic energy of particles in a gas to the gas's temperature. It's that K we saw earlier in that kinetic energy equation. And Avogadro's number, that tells us how many atoms or molecules are in a mole of a substance. Think of it as a bridge between the microscopic world of atoms and the macroscopic world we live in. So by studying these tiny particles, these random movements, physicists unlocked some of the most fundamental constants that govern how our universe works at its most basic level. That's mind-blowing. It really is. What started as this simple observation, you know, dust motes dancing in a sunbeam, it led to these profound insights into the nature of matter, energy, even the very fabric of reality. It really makes you appreciate how interconnected everything is in physics. From the tiniest particles to the largest stars, it's all part of this grand cosmic dance. And it seems like every time we answer one question, we uncover 10 more mysteries. That's the beauty of science. It's a never-ending journey of exploration. So to everyone listening, next time you see those dust motes dancing in a sunbeam, remember, you're not just watching random motion. You're catching a glimpse of the quantum world in action, a world where energy is quantized. And these tiny particles, well, they hold the keys to understanding the universe's deepest secrets.